or <clears throat> our heads. Heavenly Father, we humbly bow our heads before you at this time, and uh, especially uh, considering the topic that we're undertaking this evening, the resurrection of your uh, wonderful, blessed Son, Jesus Christ, that means so much to us. Because someday we look forward to being part of that resurrection. And uh, we're so grateful to see the faces of our brothers and sisters this evening hour. And uh, we hear the needs of uh, so many this evening hour. We know of many more that were not even mentioned. But uh, Sister Shirley, with her cancer treatments, Lord, they've been going on for a while. We pray, Lord, that you would certainly reach out and be with her. Comfort her, Lord, and let her know that you've not abandoned her. But certainly that there's a good resolution coming her way. And that she would be freed from these, this disease. There are many things that come upon mankind, and such as the dementia that's on our sister Tina's uh, sister here too, Lord, and we've been praying for her for other things, and now this has come upon her. So um, bad to hear about that, and all these diseases that have come upon mankind, and some of them we wonder because uh, we have polluted the land and the air and the waters, and we look forward to the day when Zion's established and all these things will be wiped away so we pray lord that you be with us now this evening hour brother jeremy as he presents his lesson and there there be a blessing in it for all of us and these things we pray in jesus name amen amen all right well again uh, welcome everyone we're gonna start off here with some uh uh thoughts and and scriptures tonight and uh on this good friday uh, what better place can we be talking about the resurrection and uh, fellowshipping with each other? And as always, we encourage your comments. And, you know, if you're not someone who normally does comment, um, I just want to make sure you know you're welcome to. I think the diversity of our perspectives and opinions are really what make this class so many times. And uh, I know uh, you might be sitting there in a gold nugget of wisdom that, uh, can be shared tonight. So we want to hear from anyone who feels that prompting of the Spirit and uh, know that you're loved. Um, I love you and I love the Lord and I'm so excited uh, to uh, be with you tonight. Um, so with that, I'll go ahead and share my screen. We'll get uh, underway here. And uh, we're going to, as I normally do, expound upon this verse that uh, has these words of the Lord which say, I am the resurrection and the life. And uh, <clears throat> I think that uh, I'd like to start with the fact that the Lord gave us life once before. Uh, the original <clears throat> giving of life, the creation, is such a gift. And I wonder if that isn't one of the major beefs that the Lord has with the world not appreciating that gift of life. And, you know, we exist because he made us. And not only did he make us, but he placed us in a, a paradise. And, uh, you know, you might argue that even after the fall, the world is still a remarkable, beautiful place with so many blessings. And granted, um, as Brother George mentioned in his prayer, we, we have sort of mess things up. And, uh, uh, you know, even in that comment, I feel like there's a, a bit of a, a healing and, and resurrection, you might say, back to life that, that the Lord has promised uh, in the kingdom of Zion, uh, as our brother mentioned. And so I'm kind of looking at the term resurrection broadly tonight, because I think that there are many ways in which the Lord carries out that act of bringing back to life, if we want to use that as kind of a, a very simple definition uh, for resurrection, it's kind of uh, fixing, you know, putting back together, reviving, bringing back to life. 
uh, those are some thoughts you know that might help us with that term so in the beginning i think that it's it's really uh, such a fascinating thing to talk about where we originated from and how this all how how we exist how we started and it says in the book of genesis that the lord god formed man of the dust of the ground and he breathed into his nostrils the breath of life and man became a living soul that's the first you might say great gift that the lord gave uh, to us and he goes on in that chapter and he says that uh, uh, the Lord <clears throat> created uh, uh, Eve as well. The Lord caused a deep sleep to fall upon Adam and he slept and he took one of his ribs and closed up the flesh instead thereof and the rib which the Lord God had taken for man made he a woman and brought her unto the man. And Adam said, this now is bone of my bones and flesh of my flesh. She shall be called woman because she was taken out of man. Now, this is the ideal state. The Lord has made the earth, all that is in it. He's made Adam and Eve, and he's placed them together. I think that uh, it doesn't get any more perfect, you know, in, in some sense, uh, because they had paradise. They had um, this, this blissful state. I imagine they were pretty happy, uh, you know, in some ways, but they didn't realize it because that's all they had known. They didn't really appreciate it, probably, but they had this perfect state, and I would guess they had, to some extent, a perfect uh, existence, a perfect unity, even between the two of them. Even that would be quite the miracle today, you know, uh, that peace uh, between husband and wife, right, uh, as I look over at Lynette here. Uh, so, wonderful uh, state of, of being that they are in, in this moment, and so... From there, uh, it goes on a little bit, and it says, uh, well, actually, I wanted to just pause here and, and uh, as, a, as an aside, talk about uh, how often with Easter we, we look at eggs. Uh, we have egg hunts, we have egg candy, the Easter egg, um, and, you know, often you, you'd also see things uh, representing spring and eggs are yeah baby chicks right all these things are are what uh what do they really uh make you think of birth and life and it's happening in the season of spring a season of birth and life and uh so in some sense you know the egg uh you know i know that some think that uh and, and it's probably true in history that there's pagan rituals that sort of take away you know the focus from where it should be upon uh, the birth, uh, the the death and, and resurrection of Christ, uh, and put you know puts our focus on some other things. But maybe we can reinsert some uh, good symbolism here. You know, if anyone's going to have kids or grandkids uh, doing egg hunts this weekend, maybe tell them, hey, you know that egg is representing life, and you know who gave us life? It was Christ the first time, and it's Christ the second time. You know, as we get into uh, resurrection, you know, that's, once again, uh, as we've been talking about already tonight, the Lord putting back together uh, what we've messed up, what we've lost. And so as we search for the eggs and the egg hunts this weekend, we're searching for uh, something symbolic, perhaps, a source of life. Uh, and we'll come back again uh, later uh, on a future slide here to this topic of eggs. But um, just a little fun a uh, little bit of fun there. So he puts Adam and Eve in the garden. They've been uh, brought to life. They've been given a beautiful place to live. And then he gives them a rule. He says in the 17th verse, But of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, thou shalt not eat of it. For in the day that thou eatest thereof, thou shalt surely die. Now, these are uh, originating concepts, right? We came from God's creation now, and, and we were given life. Now we're warned about death. <laughs> or, you know, they had no idea what that was, did they? But the Lord warned them and said, you know, the life I just gave you is going to be destroyed if you eat of this true tree. And so 
Uh, we're talking here about sort of a theme on this slide of life and death. God gave life, then he warned about death. And we know the story, right? Uh, the fall of man occurred, and they sure enough went ahead and did exactly what they weren't supposed to do. And they did uh, destroy, in some sense, the, the life God gave them. And here in, in the book of John, we see that the Lord already had a, a, a plan in place to redeem them from that. And this is the verse that we uh, had on our cover slide, the title slide at the beginning. So Jesus said, I am the resurrection and the life. He that believeth in me, though he were dead, yet shall he live. And whosoever liveth and believeth in me shall never die. So a lot of usage here of these terms, life and death. And, uh, you know, we, we come to know after Adam and Eve fell, uh, life as a temporary thing. And sure enough, you know, they ate and their uh, blissful, unending existence changed. They did die. Uh, they also died a spiritual death. Right, So you can take that a couple of ways. In that day that they partake of the fruit that they weren't supposed to eat, there was a spiritual death, a separation from God, and uh, the natural death, which maybe didn't happen that day, but they put it into place that day. And yet the Lord is saying, uh, despite that, though we were dead, I give you life again. And that's really what we're celebrating this, uh, this weekend. Not that we are left in a state of uh, forever paying for the, 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 the sins we, we've committed and living out those consequences infinitely, but instead, by believing in the Lord, we can yet live, and we can also, it says, never die. And so when we celebrate life this weekend, uh, and the resurrected life, it's not life in the way that we typically think of it. Because, you know, when we think of life, we think of lifespan. We think of shelf life. We think of something temporary. But we're celebrating the idea of infinite, eternal, never-ending life. So it's... it's uh, never-ending happiness, something to, uh, on an ongoing basis, be very grateful for. And uh, uh, it's, it's a source of never-ending rejoicing. So this is good to kind of keep in mind as we, as we go on here and, and think about, uh, you know, what the Lord has done for us when he gave us life the first time, and then he gave us an option for life if we choose it, right? Uh, again, a second opportunity for uh, a life that won't end. And so we know that there was uh, kind of getting back now to where we uh, left off with Adam and Eve, there was this great uh, fall, and there was a great set of consequences because of that. And so um, he says uh, unto the woman, I will greatly multiply thy sorrow and thy conception, in sorrow shalt thou bring forth children, and thy desire shall be to thy husband, and he shall rule over thee. And unto Adam he said, because thou hast hearkened unto the voice of thy wife, and hast eaten of the tree, of which I commanded thee, saying, thou shalt not eat of it, cursed is the ground for thy sake. In sorrow shalt thou eat of it all the days of thy life. Thorns also and thistles shall it bring forth to thee, and thou shalt eat the herb of the field, and the sweat of thy face shalt thou eat bread, till thou return unto the ground, for out of it wast thou taken, for dust thou art, and unto dust thou shalt return. So a lot of consequences, right? A lot of penalties given here for the, uh, uh, the act of, of, of sin that they committed. Can I, and, can and, I ask... Can I ask a yeah. question? Sure. Um, I, I don't know how many times I've read this over the years. 
it seems to me in reading this this uh, 16 to 19 the punishment to man to the man is related to the ground and eating and working and sweat in other words he has to work for a living now and and it it's delineated as to why and how if you want to eat you have to work and so on and so forth until you die you know so that's his curse uh, he, even the the ground he has to work that ground is cursed so that's an additional thing that he has to work around uh the thing i'm confused about is what uh he addresses the woman first and says i'll multiply your sorrow and thy conception and sorrow that shall be forth children i got all that and thy desire shall be to thy husband and he shall now what does that mean thy desire shall be to thy what does that actually mean brother i i yeah I, I don't get that. Well, most uh, believe that it is an uh, extension of the second part of that same sentence. So if the husband is put in a leadership or ruling position, then the desires of the wife become submitted to the desires of the husband. So it's not saying, uh, you know, at least this is my thought, that... Uh, that her desire is for the husband. It's more saying her desire is submitted to her husband. Um, and, and so it's a loss of uh, some of that authority, you might say. Uh, and, you know, I, I want to add to that a little bit because, you know, we couldn't probably say anything more unpopular uh, today. And, you know, in so many ways, again, I think that their initial state must have been so beautiful. Adam and Eve probably just uh, frolicking around the garden and having no problems. And then uh, everything that they had as a blessing in some ways were, was turned into a punishment, right? So now instead of the ground, which was blessing them to produce fruit and trees and all these wonderful things in the garden, now is bringing forth uh, thistles and thorns. This uh, you know, relationship between Adam and Eve was so beautiful. They had everything they wanted. Now there's uh, some some conflict, right? And, and so perhaps uh, this is sort of in response to Eve initiating um, a decision that uh, was against God's will without consulting uh, with her husband. But I, I don't think that the punishment here is meant to be greater for one or the other. I, I think Adam gets his fair share of punishment. He's called out as well for having uh, listened. You know, at the end of the day, I don't think it mattered too much whether uh, the person being listened to was uh, one one or the other. You know, the the serpent or or Eve. Either way, it was wrong. <laughs> And so they both receive a punishment. And I don't think necessarily that one is meant to be greater than the other. Um, and, and, and you know, in so many ways, this is, uh, is to help them understand uh, the, the significance of, of what they had done. Any other thoughts or comments on that? Yes. It seems to me that Adam was not free from the earth, the ground, he had to provide the food for life. And Eve was not free from her husband. She wow. had to be submissive to him. Just as, you know, you might think that Adam was submissive to the land because he had to work the land. And, and doing that took a lot of care. Mm -hmm. yeah that's a great great way of putting it they were both um submitted you know to different things as the punishment uh i, I like how you expressed that and um wouldn't we think though brother that 
and I, I absolutely agree with what the sister said. However, when it talks about thy desire of the woman, okay, you will bring forth children and thy desire. Well, it seems to me that her desire when she brings forth children is for the children. I mean, she's totally focused, of course, on, you know, to just to keep them alive, to keep them well, to keep them healthy and so on. And I mean, every waking moment, it seems to me, it goes toward the children. And, and so to say her desire, now, God doesn't talk at all about the man's desire. He just talks about, and he doesn't even talk about working. He just kind of describes now how difficult his life is going to be to bring forth food and so on, uh, which I understand. Uh, but when he talks about desire, it's only regarding the woman. And he says, thy desire shall be to thy husband, right after saying, in sorrow you'll bring forth children. Well, the minute the children are born, the, the pain that she endures, I, I understand, is progressively less and less, the joy of delivery and so on. I just don't understand how a woman bringing forth children and then her desire will be to her husband. It just doesn't compute to me. So I'm not that I'm you know, I ju I'm just not getting this. I, do, do the ladies have any more to add to this business? Can I say something, please? Yeah. <laughs> when a woman has a child, if she is not tending to her husband, she's going to live a miserable life. So she has to tend to both her children and her husband. And, and a lot of times, perhaps the husband might come first in some things, as long as the children are safe and fed. So that's how I feel, that regardless of what she has to bear, she has to keep her husband happy. And I say this providing he is a godly man. If he wants to lead you down roads that are ungodly, then I don't believe that this applies. Brother Jeremy? Yeah. So I take it as um, it's, it's known that the woman's going to take care of the children. That will be her, her big part of her life. That goes without saying, but that the desire shall be to the husband, whichever way he wanted to go, or, or if he wanted to plant a garden over here or whatever he wanted to do, she supports him and all that. But I just felt it goes without saying. Yeah, that's generally uh, what, what most uh, interpret that verse to be. And I think it's true that uh, the time and attention and effort level of of a mother is so taken by by the children not that the father isn't also playing a role in that but to a greater extent uh you know much more that the woman is really so occupied with uh the child rearing that that the husband has um time outside the home laboring uh you know in, in different ways and and again i think that desire you know, it kind of opts more to to him. And so, again, what they had probably was so different before this, right? So so it's good to keep in mind, this isn't the ideal state. This isn't really the way that ultimately the Lord, the Lord wanted it. It is a punishment. And, you know, it says before these verses that there would be enmity between uh, the woman and the snake, right? Uh, sometimes I get that, uh, I almost think there's also some enmity between the husband and wife, right? Because you have this punishment that's so burdensome. And it's also often viewed in, in, in equitable ways, right? And so it creates all this strife. And, uh, you know, it's a lot to make sense of, process, and, and navigate. Is it possible, brother, that, and, and again, I, I'd love for the ladies to pitch in here because I, I'm, I, I really feel, I really feel very ignorant about this, this phrase. I always have. 
And it, is it possible that it had it? Now, there was no leadership situation before the fall, right? She wasn't the leader. He wasn't the leader. God was the leader, right? Mm. And, and that changed once the fall happened. Well, uh, how did that... Uh, is it possible that it has something to do with the fact that she was the first to eat of the fruit? That the Lord said, well, from now on, the man's going to rule over you. Is that possible? Because I don't read that in there. I'm, I'm just trying to figure this thing out. Brother, Brother Bob? Yes. I think the way I see it being written, first of all, the fact that after the word children, there's a semicolon. Ah. Which means this is an entirely different thought. Okay. Different thing. Okay. And when they say thy desire shall be to your husband, I think what it's saying is what your what you you desire is going to be secondary to your husband, so that he is in charge. I think that is the punishment because I th I believe that beforehand they probably were more unequal, you know, equally, you know, they just both did what they wanted without really necessarily Very good. Being, Very good. There was know, nobody in charge. God was in charge. Right. There was, yeah, God was in charge. And it wasn't like the man said, oh, we're going to do this today. And, you know, the yeah. woman said, okay, fine. Yeah. I think at this point, this is when it changes. They were, they were more equal before. And now they're saying, because you've done this, you're going to have to, your desires are going to be second. So your desire is going to your husband. So sister, are you saying that, that what I was saying, that yes. that's a result of her being the first to fall? I, I don't know if it's because she was the first, but that does seem like that would be a good punishment for that. <laughs> <laughs> Many people uh, do surmise that, but I don't know that we can really say it for sure. Yeah, it isn't written in there at all. And, and that's yeah. why, you know, this is conjecture, but and it's all tied up in thy desire shall be to thy husband. I said, thank you, sister, for your input. I appreciate it. This is a mystery yeah, to me. Those are good Jeremy. thoughts, I think. And uh, I have you something know, to I, say. Okay. I, I, it, something nobody has brought out, that I will greatly multiply thy sorrow and thy conception. You're going to have more children than you would have before. If you even had, I think they had children before. That's just me. But I will multiply thy sorrow and thy conception. So she's a lot more busier with having babies and raising them. And yeah, I, I really think a big part of this is, again, not necessarily that one sin between Adam and Eve was greater than another, or that one punishment was greater than another. We, we could think maybe that's theoretically the case, but I don't think we really know that. Um, but what we are seeing here is a great punishment, and a lot of that punishment is labor, whether it's in child raising or providing, both now have to labor so much. And so really what we're looking at here is a division of that labor. And because the mother is so busy taking care of the kids and maybe not out seeing what's going on uh, as much uh, outside the home, her, her ability to make all those decisions is, is limited. And so it's not necessarily, again, that um, one is put over the other and greater, um, but that it's a division of labor and it's right. hard because right. of all this burden. Now it's harder to function and it's so imperfect. And so whether it's that or the other things we read about here and how labor and sweating and toiling are now the reality they live in, what I wanted to kind of, and you might be wondering, why are we talking about all this tonight? Uh, well, it, it really highlights how bad this is and how great it is that the Lord provides a solution to it all. Because really, as we kind of go from here, we're going to be transitioning into how the Lord puts all of these bad things back together again. See, in the Lord, we can find strength to overcome the challenges. We can find the, the desire and hope and faith 
uh, to be diligent and do our labor. We can find the wisdom of God to put marriages back together, to function in a way that works. Because, you know, um, later on there is commandments given, right? Even in the New Testament, that, that the husband would give himself for his wife as the Lord gave himself for the church. And, and if, if, if he's that kind of person, then it's not quite as uh, detrimental to think that he would be a good uh, person to make decisions. Uh, now, if he's not doing that, as someone said earlier, then this all kind of falls apart. But the Lord provides a solution to all of these uh, problems and a deliverance from all of these punishments, ultimately. And so that's, I think, the, the upside, the exciting part to look forward to. I just think it's incorrect to assume that just because of this quote that you have here, that the man got has the worst of the jobs. Because to me, my mother in the 50s, I mean, she, she so far outworked my father, it isn't even funny. I mean, one of these hand wringing washing machines, you know and hanging out the wash outside, and ironing with an actual iron, you know, and I mean, on, and, and the cooking, and the shopping, holy mackerel, I mean, my dad had it, I'm, I'm telling you, I, dad and I used to talk about this, he had it easy in comparison. Okay. Yeah, I, I agree, absolutely, and I think there's no question here that this punishment is brutal. Yes. And my point is, uh, it's, it's even more brutal without the Lord, right? There's a solution to the fall. Isn't that the essence of Christ? And so uh, all of these Jeremy, things will be overcome with his help. Jeremy. Yeah. You know, I, I can't accept that word punishment. Um, I never grew up thinking that. Uh, I always took it as a consequence. It's like, it, it was like him telling, like God telling, if you, if you go up into that tree and you take a bite out of that fruit and you fall, you, and you fall out of that tree, you're going to get hurt. I mean, it's a, not a punishment, but a consequence of what would happen. Not, not, not as, because God is not a punishing God. He didn't create us to punish us. He created us, uh, as Nephi, I think Nephi said it, so that we would have joy. But um, mm -hmm. I, I just can't accept that part of, of it being a punishment from God, because I don't think God punishes us. And everything is a consequence. I, I feel that if, if we sin, God can't look upon us. And he has to turn away from us and when he, when that, that happens then we're wide open to satan now satan will punish us but not because of eve he punishes us because of our sin our sinful ways i guess i'm, I'm not following the the difference between the two right. uh, I but i think that uh you know the lord ultimately at the end is a judge and will execute either a punishment or a deliverance from that punishment if we make that correct choice of redemption. Uh, but, you know, feel free to add. I mean, I'm just trying to figure out like how you're defining the two terms, punishment versus consequence. But I think either way, the Lord's giving us a consequence uh, for actions, but he's also saying, I'm not going to leave you there either. I'm going to help you. And that's what's so beautiful is that he really could have just said, you know what, you've now fallen and I'm going to leave you that way. <laughs> but he, he's, he's not. Um, that's the, you know, what we were mentioning at the beginning is that he's giving us life twice. He's giving us an option to recover all that was lost. Okay. Wonderful thoughts and good, good discussion. And, and just to kind of, um, uh, you know, close out this part of it, it says here in the next few verses, unto Adam also and to his wife, did the Lord God make coats of skins and clothe them? And he said, behold, uh, 
the man has become as one of us to know good and evil. And now lest he put forth his hand and partake of the tree of life and eat and live forever. Therefore, the Lord sent him forth from the garden. So this now adds to the consequences or however you want to say it, right? Because on top of everything we just read, they're also getting kicked out of paradise, right? And so um, they're, they're sent, he's, he's sending them out uh, to till the ground, right? So now they're, existence becomes one of labor and the garden is sealed or guarded you know by these um uh this flaming sword right and uh, they're not able to come back and enter in so that's kind of uh representative of our current state and as you said uh uh brother george this is that verse i think you were just mentioning uh in second nephi it says here adam fell that men might be. So we immediately, it says here, and men are that they might have joy. We immediately begin to see that the Lord has a solution for this state that we've gotten ourselves into. And uh, it really starts to expound upon that in the book of 1 Corinthians. And he says uh, here in the 50th verse of chapter 15, now this I say, brethren, that flesh and blood cannot inherit the kingdom of God. Neither doth corruption inherit uh, incorruption. And so uh, he, he's saying a lot there. He's saying that, you know, in our state, we're not able to inherit the, the kingdom. But he says, behold, I show unto you a mercy, uh, a mystery. We shall not, not all sleep, but we shall all be changed in a moment in the twinkling of an eye at the last trump, for the trumpet shall sound and the dead shall be raised incorruptible. So he's basically saying there in so many words, regardless of when you die or pass away, or if you do, everyone will be changed from corruption to incorruption. And he's talking about a resurrection. He's talking about following in the footsteps of the resurrection of Christ. And now we're starting to get into the Easter message, what it means that the Lord was revived from death, that he came back from that state, that his soul and body, his body was put back together and the soul and body were reunited. Um, and, and, and that would be setting the stage or blazing the trail, if you will, for what we would experience in the day that's being spoken of here. And he says, uh, uh, for this corruptible must put on incorruption and this mortal must put on immortality. And so he kind of uh, reiterates that message over and over here in these verses in a few different ways. And uh, he says, it shall be brought to pass. The saying that is written, death is swallowed up in victory. Okay, this is the Easter message, isn't it? It says, death, O oh death, where is thy sting? And O oh grave, where is thy victory? See, in the plan of redemption, everything that we just read that's so awful in, in terms of the consequences of the fall of man are being unraveled, undone, and, and we are becoming victorious over them by the mercy of God if we so choose to follow in his, his path. And so he says um, at the end, thanks be to God which giveth us the victory through our Lord Jesus Christ. And so though there's a fall and though there's a, uh, a punishment or a consequence of that fall, there is redemption. Uh, and, and that's the resurrection, uh, you know, ultimately, right? We're, we're going through different phases between now and then, but ultimately that is the plan of God, the ending state that we all look forward to. Okay, I have a song, but let me pause. Anyone have uh, thoughts or comments or, or questions on what we've been kind of putting forth so far? Brother Jeremy. Yeah. I've always had one curiosity. The, uh, they were told not to eat of the tree of life. Why weren't they told not to eat of the tree? I mean, the tree of knowledge. Why weren't they told not to eat of the tree of life? Okay. Yeah, I mean, forever. that's the really good question. And I guess my take would be that they were already in 
a state of eternal life. And so eating it would have had no consequence. But only because they hadn't sinned. If they had sinned and separated themselves from God, then it became not okay to enter into uh, that eternal uh, living mode again before a redemption or atonement had been made. And so it, it didn't really matter at that time whether they ate of that tree because they were already in this you know, infinite or eternal state and there was no sin and there was no punishment for it. But when they took the the tree of knowledge fruit, everything changed. So the cherubim, it says, protect the way of, your, your quote was, the way of the tree of life. That in other words, the tree of life is still there, and the cherubim are standing there with a flaming sword, which goes this way and that, protecting mm. the way of it. Now, why? Why is it protecting or, or facing in all ways? Or Well, what you're telling us here is that Jesus is the way, the truth, and the life. Well, why do we need a tree of life? Yeah, I, I think it's all... Um... Uh, fairly symbolic at this point. Um, you okay. know, it's like Lehi and the tree that he saw, you know, that he also had that fruit um, and that tree. And, and I don't think they literally partook <coughs> of it, but I think spiritually they did. Okay. Brother Jeremy. Yeah. I was just thinking about Lehi's and Nephi's vision of the tree. And what Nephi says is the tree is the love of God. Yeah. Yeah, it gives you, doesn't it, the, the symbolic meaning right there. Yeah, that's right. Okay, well, um, I'd, I'd like to share this song with you. I think it's a good one for Easter. <laughs> and and uh, I'd love to hear any thoughts you have about the uh, the words here in this song. I'm going to get my music out here. This is number 35. The resurrection morning will be shining bright and clear. Every eye shall see the Lord, and every ear shall hear. For every grave shall open on that resurrection morn, and everybody cries again, never had been born. From the ocean's blackness to the resurrection's light. Beneath the desert floors they'll come from every ancient side. From every jungle's lost confined, from every river bend. From every field and mound on earth. Then give up them. From every hillside grave, they'll come from every hidden tomb. From every child and they from many mother's womb. When every bones will open wide and every graveyard green. And they have been for rise up to be seen. From the ocean's blackness to the resurrection's light. Beneath the desert floors they'll come from every ancient sun. From every jungle's lost confined, from every river, 
So, uh, boy, there's just so much here, and it really expands upon the idea of Easter, doesn't it? Um, we, I think we are uh, rightly so. We focus on Christ coming back. We love Christ. We want him to come back. We want him to be the king. We want him to lead Israel. We want him to fulfill all his prophecies. But he's also made this prophecy, this promise that will be resurrected. That was uh, what he was teaching us. He was illustrating it. He was exemplifying it. And he went first as the greatest and made the way for us to follow. Um, but, uh, you know, certainly, you know, there, there's a lot here to, uh, to think about as it, uh, as it talks about these events and how they'll come to pass. So when did, when, where does Zion fit in with what you just Sam. Well, you're going to get me into trouble here, brother. <laughs> <laughs> I'm already in trouble. I don't get... <laughs> because because I know that when uh, when Bob Sullivan dies, what you're saying is when Bob Sullivan dies, what you just sang doesn't happen to him then. So say that again, your, your last part. Me? Yeah. Okay. When Bob Sullivan dies, what happens to him at that moment isn't what you just read about. Or correct. Sang. Yeah, that's right. That's right? Yeah, that's okay. correct. So, because so what you just sang about happens way after that? Possibly. Uh, so So there is that time, and... Uh, it, it occurred prior to Christ's resurrection, right? In which those who died, dating back to even when we read about Samuel and those who were in Abraham's bosom, were waiting, even in the spiritual state after death, in paradise for the day of resurrection to come. And then it, it talks about multiple resurrections in the Book of Mormon, right? And uh, how there's some debate well which is the first and second and, you know how many resurrections but it, it's part of the process of god that he inst instantiates this idea that there would be people who pass they go to a spiritual realm and then enter at certain interval along the way there would be these resurrections so you're right there, there are two different things mm -hmm. Gonna... is that not at the end of the world with that thing when the books are open yeah. wide that would that's be where... after Zion, yeah that's where the, that's where the trouble starts but i i think that you're right that is um that is definitely uh uh something that has to happen and in and before judgment day right because this song is giving you this sense that you know everyone would be brought back the graves would yield up their dead. That's the resurrection, the flesh and the soul being reunited, and then the judgment books being opened, right? Right, right. I always thought that this was the talking about the second resurrection. And the scripture does say that 
The second death has no power over those that have risen in the first resurrection. Yes, that's right. So there's no there's no chance that uh, let's say a person John Smith he he died and John Smith uh, didn't go to heaven. Okay, he he went to hell or whatever for his deeds in the flesh or whatever. But there's no chance that J John Smith rising up again to take part in what you just sang about. Mm -hmm. There's no chance, or is there, that his destination might change? So I, I don't know how clear everyone is on this, but I'll tell you what I take from the scriptures. Thank you. Um, what, what our sister just said is true, and it's also true that uh, there isn't a switching of paths, uh, you know, from... Uh, one place to another, one path to another after you die. And so the 40th chapter of Alma, you know, talks about uh, one path from this life, you're waiting for the obvious outcome, either uh, salvation or dreading the alternative, right? And so whether it's that you are resurrected and your place with God has been determined or you're waiting to be resurrected, Either way, the state in which you leave this life in the flesh is the state you'll wake up in uh, in future uh, uh, states, whether that be the the outer darkness or the final judgment and condemnation, or on the other hand, paradise in the final resting state in the kingdom. So same answer, regardless of whether you're res resurrected or not, uh, it, it, you know, there isn't a switching of your your uh, destiny after this life, right? Your your decisions made, your your uh, outcome is is really determined by how you spend your time in the flesh, in the probationary state, and 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 the 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 part that I was alluding to is is problematic as well. How many resurrections are there, and when yeah. will they all happen? That's tricky. Um, that, that's the wonder, and I didn't really mean to get into the tricky part because I do understand that it, that it's tricky. However, I'm trying to fit Zion in there somewhere because, to me, uh, correct me if I'm wrong, brother. Zion is like unto a resurrection. It, it, to me, the earth is resurrected, the animals and the fish are resurrected, and they're groaning and waiting for all this to happen because it can't happen until it happens to mankind. And then when mankind is resurrected in Zion, then the earth is resurrected and the animals and so on. Am I this, off there? This Zion has nothing to do with the resurrection. The resurrection is after Zion. It's talking about the first resurrection. And that's why uh, even in the, in the garden, that's why the tree was there to give man a choice. Because yeah, if God wanted man to live forever, he wouldn't have put, put the tree there. I think he knew at some point they would choose, just like we do today. And, the, and that's why the resurrection plan was put in place from the beginning. And uh, God knew man would fall. It was necessary for it to fall or we wouldn't be all here today. And we all have that. We all have that same choice. Yeah. And... Uh, Zion's just part of the picture. You know, we hope we all make it that far. But as far as really, it don't matter because like uh, my uncle, Brother Jim Moore, uh, before he passed away, he was he was failing for a good while that every Sunday he would get up and testify. If I don't if I die, I'll go to paradise. If I live, I'll see Zion. He says, I can't lose. I win either way. And uh, but the main thing is to be prepared. And if you're prepared and if you see Zion, that's great. But if not, it don't matter. You're going to see it one way or the other, you could say, from the other side. Yeah. Yeah, and I do like the theme, you know, however, that there are so many things the Lord's bringing back. You know, if you, if you really crudely interpret the term, you know, resurrection and try to apply it to various things, you know, the Lord is, is restoring or reviving or resurrecting 
you know, it's a theme in, in so many ways. And I think Zion, the animals, the state of the earth, the lifting of the curse, the return of Eden, all these things are part of the Lord's plan to um, recover what we've lost, right, in, in various uh, uh, shapes and forms. So, um, yeah, very good comments. Okay, well, um, I'll just give you a couple parting thoughts here. I know we're getting already past the hour, but I wanted to, um, whoops, just bring out a couple of things if my computer will work. Maybe it won't. Oh, I see what's happening. Um, okay, there we go. So I thought I would share with you Humpty Dumpty tonight. I told you I was going to um, talk about eggs one more time. What does Humpty Dumpty have to do with Easter? Any thoughts? So we have this idea, <laughs> right? How does it go? Humpty Dumpty sat on a wall. Humpty Dumpty had a great fall. Who else had a great fall? Adam and Eve. I'm looking at Kate right now as I'm teaching this. And all the king's horses and all the king's men could not put Humpty back together again. Well, this is an interesting parallel, isn't it? So initially, the state of the egg is what? It's placed high on this wall in a safe place. But then it sort of takes its place of safety for granted. It precariously walks around and falls off the wall. And it breaks into a million pieces. And no one can put that egg back together except the Lord. Humpty Dumpty had a great fall. Adam and Eve had a great fall. And, uh, you know, though we could have been left in uh, this state of ruin after we had surrendered our, our place of uh, safety and well-being, the Lord helps us and, and gives us uh, a, a solution and, and helps us to miraculously get back what we, we've lost. And so I, I thought that was kind of also a little symbolism for eggs for us here. And uh, again, as we've been laying out here tonight, when we sin and when we have the, uh, you know, the, the, the fallout from that, you know, whether you look at the fall of man or the corruption of the church or the scattering of Israel or the curse upon, um, you know, uh, you might say just unity between people. Yeah. <laughs> uh, you know, even the difficulties that man and woman and husband and wife face, all, you know, the blessings of, of Eden, all these things were, were broken. And so the significance of our detriment can hardly be overstated. It's a rough deal uh, that we really got ourselves into. And, and in turn, what does God do? He gives us an answer. This resurrection term can certainly be applied to the soul. He also puts our soul and body back together. He's got a plan for us to put our relationships back together. In him, our friendships, our marriages, our family, th these are all restored. He's looking to bring back the blessings of Eden. He, he's restored the church, and now he's going to restore Israel. So all these broken eggshells... You know, this mess that we've created, the Lord's going to bring it all back together. And when we see that come into its final form, finally perfected again, I think it's going to blow our minds. Mm -hmm. It's going to be so absolutely stunning to see the Lord's plan culminate in this way that is greater than we can imagine. And so um, I thought that would be a great lead up to this song. <laughs> And, you know, when we had our uh, ordination for Brother Ramon and C. Benito, we opened the weekend with this song. We went into that weekend saying, you know what? The Lord's going to do some amazing things here this weekend. He's going to set off a work and a motion that's going to have a blessing for Israel, for Joseph. And let's go into this weekend with the thought that there's nothing that Jesus cannot do. And so... Uh, I thought I would uh, close with that. Um, before I do that, any last comments or thoughts tonight? 
I like I like to uh, uh, give an experience. Yeah. Um, <clears throat> yeah. I don't know if everybody knows, uh, which has passed away now, Frank Gennaro. Uh When we were in San Fernando Valley, he lived across the field from me. And Frank always had a bad ulcer. And his ulcer broke. And we rushed him to the hospital. And he was in pretty bad shape. And he told me, he said, well, he, they were operated on him right away. And he had this dream. And he said, he says, I went to heaven. And he says, I met my father, which his father died several years before that. And he started walking towards his father, really dressed up nice. And his father told him to stop. Do not cross this line. Your time is not yet. Mm -hmm. But he says, I want you to look over there. He said, you're building, you're a mansion. So brothers and sisters, we've got to build our mansions while we're here on the face of the earth. Very good. Yeah. It's beautiful. Wonderful. Well, I'll uh, share this with you briefly here. Um, such a joyous hymn. There's no one can mean as much as Jesus means to me. There's nobody else I know that died to set me free. There's no one can love as much as Jesus can love me. There's not anything at all that Jesus cannot do. He can heal the lame and blind. All afflictions of the mind can bring the sinners out of sin. And all the prodigals back in, he can show himself to be just like he did and Galilee can make a life completely whole and he alone can save a soul there's no one can mediate like Jesus can for me there's nobody on the throne at God's right hand but who there's no one can stand beside like Jesus will be. There's not anything at all that Jesus cannot do. He can heal the lame and blind and all afflictions of the mind can bring the sin and out of sin and all the problems back in. He can show himself to be just like he did at the Galilee. He can make a life completely whole, and he alone can save a soul. There's no one can calm the waves and still the sea. There's nobody else that ever brought us peace to be. There's no one who can shine the sun like Jesus can for you. There's not a very big at all that Jesus cannot do. He can heal the name and blind all the shoes of the mind. Can bring the sinners out of sin and all the prodigals that we can. He can show himself to me, just like he did at Galilee. Can make a life completely whole, and he alone can save us all. Amen.
Amen. That's really um, what we're uh, ultimately talking about tonight, isn't it? That um, there's no one that can mediate for us like Jesus can. And that's why he went through what he did. He suffered greatly. And there's this continual, um, you know, stark contrast between what could have been and what the Lord um, brought out of that tragedy, right? Uh, we see that play out so many times, even in the songs, it talks about uh, from the ashes, what the Lord brings forth, you know, something of beauty that comes uh, even from the ruins of our, our lives. And so there's nothing he cannot do. And ultimately, um, there's there's a, a redemption for the sinner. Uh, that's really uh, what we praise God for, uh, for this weekend and for every day, every day of our lives. Well, uh, with that, I thank you. I pray God blesses you. It's, uh, it's always so wonderful to see you tonight. I hope you have a wonderful Easter. We send our love and uh, our prayers uh, your way. And uh, if there's nothing else, uh, I would like to ask uh, Brother Jim Speck, if you're on, if you could close this in prayer. I want yeah, to hear I want to say thank you for the spirit in our lessons tonight. Thank God. Amen. Enjoyed this evening with everybody. And again, you know, we wish everybody a wonderful Easter weekend. Right. And let's pray. Lord, we come to you tonight, Father, even as we rejoice in the resurrection morning. We're so grateful to be together and to listen to your word for blessing Brother Jeremy with. Our lesson tonight is we bring forth so many great and wonderful things, this wonderful kingdom of Zion and the greater latter day work, Father, the songs of Zion. And we pray that you'd bless each and every head that's bowed tonight, Father. Bless those that have been mentioned that are sick and afflicted. Lord, we look forward to the day. There'll be no more sick, no more sorrow, Lord. We'll have the joy that we truly desire from you, Lord, and that we would be a, a joyful people, Lord, and that we would look forward to great and wonderful things. So bless us tonight, Lord. Bless us this weekend as we celebrate um, your son's resurrection, an opportunity of eternal life once again to your people. So Lord, thanks for all things. Watch, guide, and direct us, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. 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 Happy Easter, everybody. <laughs> Good night, everyone. God bless.